That was weak. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Um, I've got to say thank you, Dr. Craig, Dr. David. Really appreciate being with you guys and leaning lean, lean from you guys. It's nice to be able to sit and listen too and to learn. And so I appreciate that. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk with the young folks, uh, parents, grandparents, old folks. I'm sorry, mature folks. Um, pray for this generation. Boy, do they need our prayers. So, um, appreciate it. I don't know. Is it me? You know what I'm saying? I mean, is it just me or, or is something just not right there? Why am I going to pay three times more for plastic pennies? Why not just use the real deal? Save two dollars and forty nine cents. I don't. I, I don't know. Okay. Um, imagine we're coming in this room and on this table here, we're going to take a look at some of these items on the table. And uh, well, let me just see here. Take a look at this item here. What? What is that? Globe. I mean, you get up, you look at it, and and it's a globe. Carl, what's the big deal? So what? What's your point? Well, my point is this: Satan is a father of lies. He's very good at deceiving. And he does an extremely good job. That is not a globe. That is actually a picture of a globe. So, you got to be careful. Because Satan knows how to deceive. So, let, let me see now. Let me see how critical you guys are with your watching here. How about these glasses right here? Let's focus on the glasses. Are the glasses real or are they a picture? Who says they're real? Who says they're a picture? Interesting. 90% of you got it correct. Yeah, they're, they're actually real glasses. So good, you're looking, you're observing, and that's a great thing. But there's only one th problem, you missed something. The table's not real. How about this one? How about this one? Um, the yellow dots. Are they bigger, smaller, various sizes, what? They're all the same size. Watch. I just got rid of the blue, and every one of those yellow dots are exactly the same size. Satan knows how to deceive. And you and I have got to get very, very critical in the way that we look at things. And so uh, I just want to challenge you tonight to try to take these things that we've been talking about and apply them. When I read the scripture, this is, what I, this is what I get from it, okay? It tells me to be strong and of good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that does go with you. He will not fail you. He'll never forsake you. God wants you and I to be bold. He really does. The only way that I can be bold is when I'm speaking on his terms, though, not on mine. Because if I try to speak about me, man, I'm, I'm not very bold. There's only one challenge. You can only talk about what you know about. And I, I think that's a part of what's going on in our culture today. Can I talk for an hour about football? Yeah, oh yeah. Vikings fan, by the way. Yes, long-term friend, Tarkenden, purple people eaters. I go way back, okay? Um, how about uh, buffets? Yes, I can talk for an hour on buffets. I love buffets because when you go to buffets, you can get all the food groups, chicken, beef, pork, shrimp. I don't want green and yellow. I want chicken, beef, pork, shrimp, and chocolate for dessert. Thank you very much. Um, but can I talk for an hour about why I know that I can trust the Word of God with all my heart, soul, mind, strength? Can I talk about those things? Can I talk about the things that the world is throwing at us to get us to not trust it? You see, you can only talk about what you know about. And this is the challenge. That's why I think these types of con uh, conferences are so, so important to get folks encouraged into studying a little bit deeper. You see, I think um, one of the other tools that I like to use are just critically evaluating what the world throws at us. So Wendy Wright is a former president for Concerned Women for America. Richard Dawkins shows up at her office one day with a film crew, unannounced, and he walks in, and he just started peppering her with questions, and they filmed it. It was for a TV series that uh, Richard Dawkins was doing, and he later used parts of the clip and just really mocked and ridiculed Wendy Wright. But he put the entire interview up. Somebody put the entire interview up on uh, YouTube, so I got it, and I watched through it. And as I watched through it, I said, you know what? 
Who am I? I'm a nobody. But I'm going to go through that and pick it apart and just start showing that maybe there are answers to some of the claims that he makes. As I was going through it, though, I started noticing some things. I started noticing tools that are used to get us to doubt. And so I want to identify some of the tools that are used to get us to where we are today. Because they're the same tools used over and over again. And one of the tools that's used to get us to doubt in our world today is condescension. It's a very effective tool. Now, I am going to use sarcasm. If you haven't been able to pick that up by now, I use sarcasm, big time, for a very specific reason. I'm trying to keep you awake. So I use sarcasm. But trust me, when I'm in a conversation with somebody who doesn't know the Lord, I'm not mocking, I'm not ridiculing, because Jesus Christ died for them as much as he died for any one of us sitting in this room. And this is not about mocking or making fun of somebody or, or their beliefs. My heart breaks when I see what some people are believing. But I am going to challenge, I'm going to get point to, to get very pointed, to try to get people to just start struggling through some of these issues. So there's no disrespect, but I will definitely use sarcasm. Condescension, though, is a tool that the, the secular world uses in a big way. You know, I, I didn't do this tonight, but uh, before y'all, most of y'all came in here, we had the, uh, the high schoolers and college age. But every college age group that I've spoken to over the last year, I ask them a question. How many in here have had a professor in the university that on day one says, okay, are there any Christians in here? And if hands go up, he immediately says, okay, one of three things. Pick your books up, get out of here, because I'm not wasting my breath. Number two, we'll see about that by the time this class ends. Or number three, hmm, okay, and then the rest of your time in that class is a living nightmare. I have not had a, a group that I've spoken to in the last year where I've not had at least one college-age student go through that. And it's typically more than that. Because the world is getting very, very effective, and condescension is one of those tools. So let's, start, let's take the clips from uh, the Richard Dawkins, Wendy Wright interview and start breaking them down and see if we can't get some tools to, uh, to defend our faith with. Where, where did you study science? You know, this is probably one of the big attacks that I get quite a bit, because as I told you at the very beginning, I do not have a PhD in science. I have two honorary doctorates. Uh, that is because people felt sorry for me and they gave them to me. I don't even talk about them, all right? I don't put it in titles or anything like that. Two, pl two places felt bad for me and was like, we're going to give this to you. Thank you very much. Uh, but I do not have a PhD in science. So that's one of the things. Well, who do you think you are then to talk about science? Hmm, interesting question. May I? May I? Dr. Dawkins, where did I study science? Let me ask you a question first. Where did you study the Bible? Do you have a PhD in the Bible, sir? Because you sure have a lot to say about it. And if you don't have a PhD in it, why are you talking about it? Because by your standard, I shouldn't be talking about science because I don't have a PhD. Well, you shouldn't be talking about Christianity because you don't have a PhD in Christianity either. Where did you attend Bible college? The question shouldn't be, where did I study? The question should be, what I, what I am saying, is it correct or not? Is it lining up with truth, with facts or not? Because if I am saying something that's incorrect, I want to be corrected. I really do. I don't want to pass on bad information. But we get intimidated because they love to mock and... <laughs> Who do you think you are? Sarcasm is a very effective tool. I use it when I get with the younger generation uh, as well, when I'm in like in the classroom setting, and I'll ask them questions, and when they give an answer, even if it's a correct answer, I'll mock them. I do. It's like, what? You believe? Let me give you an example. This is, a, this is a simple one, but I do it. You already know I'm setting you up for it, but um, fill in the blank, please. The wages of sin is what? You fundamentalist hicks, where did they dig you up from? You believe that the wages of sin is death. Come with me to the local museum. I'll take you in there. I'll show you a fossil that is 100, 200, 300 million years old. That is a dead thing. Adam did not live 400 million years ago. Do not tell me that the wages of sin is death because I'll take you and show you fossils that predate Adam by millions of years. Dinosaurs died out 68 million years ago. Adam didn't live 68 million years ago. Don't tell me the wages. Guys, I'm telling you. And you see Christians who... Fade into the background, become quiet as a minimum, disappear. Because they don't know how to come. Excuse me, we don't have to be jerks. We don't have to be disrespectful, but we can be very pointed back. Uh, uh, may I? May I, please? You see, guys, that's what we want to do because God commands us to be bold. When, when God says to speak the truth in love, we speak the truth. 
Checking our motivations. And that's a difficult one for me. So what was the evidence that Dr. Dawkins used to really go after Wendy? Because if you can't tell, I love that part of it. I love the, okay, what is the evidence? What, is the fossils? What is it? Let's take a listen to what I'm he's sorry, got. but we can show you the evidence. All you need to do is read an elementary textbook of biology. It's all there. Well, uh, inter that's interesting you should bring out the textbooks on biology. We still have textbooks today. Yeah, I know you're going to talk show... about peppered moths and you're going to talk about Haeckel's embryos. No, no. Uh, in fact, what I was going to talk about is the, what they claim to be the evolution of a fetus in the womb yes. based on Haeckel's hand embryos. drawings, yeah. which have been proven to be and yet they continue to be published in sci scientific textbooks. Heckel's embryos are just one little thing. It's a Victorian thing. Plenty of people made mistakes in And Victorian. yet continues to be published in today's textbooks. Well, no longer actually, but, but I don't think it's really fair, is it, to pick on particular Victorian mistakes. It is a Victorian mistake. Oh, I mean, but it was carried over into the 20th date? century. Yes, and that was a mistake, and, and that's been corrected. Okay. Okay. By the way, did you catch the uh, first comment? All you need to do is read an elementary textbook on biology. Did you catch the condescension? Believe it or not, I actually have read an elementary textbook on biology. I even read a college-level textbook on biology. I don't have a PhD in biology, but I did read it. That shocks you, but I can read. You see, guys... What, remember what he brought up? Embryonic recapitulation. That was a Victorian mistake. That's been fixed. That's, that's no longer being used. Really? Is that a correct quote? I want to make sure that I'm, I've got that accurate. That was a mistake and that's been corrected. What is he referring to? Many of you are familiar with this. The old drawings from the late 1800s where Haeckel drew various uh, embryos from a variety of, uh, you know, people and pigs and chickens and fish and and looky there, looky there, they all look alike. And uh, it was taught at one time that, oh, as a child goes through the developmental stages inside the mother, it goes through a fish stage, it goes through a pig stage. It, uh, you have gill slits, you have a tail. Well, those drawings were known to be fraudulent in the late 1800s. Within a matter of years of them coming out, they were known to be fraudulent. But today it's a lot easier to show that they're fraudulent because now we can take actual pictures of the embryos, Okay. So that's the fish embryo drawing. That's the actual embryo. You can go look at these things, and what you see is not consistent with what you see in the textbooks, and those pictures are still being used in the textbook. And by the way, one of the textbooks that I read, the college level, the molecular biology of the cell, this is what is taught inside there. Early developmental stages of animals whose adult forms appear radically different are often surprisingly similar. Neo-Darwinian mechanisms explain why embryos of different species so often resemble each other in early stages as they develop seem sometimes to replay the steps of evolution. These pictures are still in the textbooks. I know this because I have the high school students that are coming to me and they're showing them to me. Uh, this is a, a human being and you have gill slits and you have a tail. That's the way that they mark it. You never had gill slits. Never. Pharyngeal pouches, absolutely, but they have nothing to do with respiration. You, have, you don't have gill slits. And a tail, you don't have a tail. Think of it for a second. If you have something that has a beginning, it has to have an end. That's reality. Well, that's a tail. That is not a tail. Coccyx, now we have call it the tailbone, which is a bad thing, to be real honest, because I think it's uh, deceiving to people. You don't think that's an important thing? You don't think having an end is an important thing? Well, you better have an end. And by the way, if you didn't have the coccyx, that tailbone, you're not walking upright. Very important connecting point to, so that you can walk upright. Has anybody ever fallen on their tailbone, quote-unquote? Anybody? It's not important, right? Yeah. How long did it hurt? A long time. Because it's an extremely important connecting point. Well, we have children that are born with tails. No, we do not. You Look, I've seen pictures. I've gone and looked at these in a big way. And you've got children that there are a couple of uh, deformities. There are a couple of mutations that happen that cause these uh, fatty cysts to type grow. But as far as a, a, a tail with caudal vertebrae in it and muscles, to, they're no, no, no. You don't see that. And it's always, well, I can't say always. The vast majority of the time, it is connected with some other mutation, some other really nasty thing. But children with tails, it's not true. These are still in the textbooks. This is a textbook, uh, McGraw-Hill. Exact same pictures. 
By the way, this one written by Douglas Fudiyama, exact same pictures. He knows that those pictures aren't true. Think about this. This is a quote that he gave. As such, if textbooks use the drawings at all, it is a historical example and as a way to illustrate the concept in such a way that students are able to grasp it immediately. Even if the drawings are fraudulent, they can still be used for this purpose because the concept they illustrate is by no means fraudulent. So help me understand this. It's okay for me to use fake pictures to prove a true point. Nobody else have a problem with that? How about we get radical here? How about we use real pictures to prove a real point? Why do we have to use fake pictures to prove a real point? Guys, Satan doesn't play fair. And by the way, the, one of the other tools that he loves to use to get us to doubt is deception. He's the father of it. He knows how to use it very well. So, what evidence does he use to prove that we have evolved from ape-like ancestor? Well, let's just let him talk. Or even beyond that, surely there'd be at least one There's a evidence. Massive amount of evidence. I'm sorry, but you people keep repeating that like a kind of mantra because you you just listen to each other. I mean, if only you would just open your eyes and look show at the evidence. Show it to me. Show me the well, show me the bones. Show me the carcass. Show me the evidence of uh, the in between stage from one species to another. Every time a fossil is found which is in between one species and another you guys say ah oh, now we've got two gaps where, there, where previously there was only one I mean almost every fossil you find is intermediate <laughs> with something and something else. If that else. were the case the Smithsonian National His Natural History Museum would be filled with these examples well, but it, instead it they're is. not. It is. Oh I'm liking it now because I love leading tours through the Smithsonian. Uh, by the way did you catch the you people you people. I'm telling you, condescension's a big one. Uh, help me out here. Let me, uh, let me just get this straight before we go any further. Massive amount of evidence. Can somebody give me a definition for massive? Humongous. Can you give me a definition for humongous? I'm a simple guy. Huge, large. Uh, can you give me a number? What, what, what would a number be that would be massive? Thousands? Billions? Hundreds? Ten? A dozen. A dozen. So a dozen would qualify for massive. Okay. I just want to know. I'm just trying to figure this out. Uh, listen for a theme here, please. Um, now, I, in, in full disclosure, this next clip is a montage. You know what I'm talking about. I went through and I pulled clips. But listen for a theme, please, because it's kind of interesting what goes on here. Um, yes, it's going to appear that he is cutting her off. And he does do that, but it looks even more dramatic because I've got a montage and it's clips put together, okay? But listen and see if you notice anything in this exchange. Now, in the case of humans, uh, since Darwin's time, there's now enormous amount of evidence about intermediates in human fossils. I and mean, we've got various species of Australopithecus, for example, uh, and these are... I mean, some Australopithecus are intermediate between others and ourselves. Then you've got Homo habilis, Homo erectus. These are intermediate between Australopithecus, which was an older species, and um, Homo sapiens, which is a younger species. I mean, why don't you see those as intermediates? <laughs> when I just told you about Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens. A beautiful, by the way, archaic Homo sapiens and then modern Homo sapiens. That's a beautiful series of You're intermediates. You're still lacking the material evidence. The so material evidence is there. Go <laughs> to the museum and look so at it. I now, I presented you with, I don't have them here, obviously, but you can go to any museum and you can see Australopithecus, you can see Homo habilis, you can see Homo erectus, you can see archaic Homo sapiens and modern Homo sapiens. A beautiful series of intermediates. Why do you keep saying, present me with the evidence? Well, I've done so. Go to the museum and, and look. And I'm not convinced have it, you seen Homo have, have you seen Homo erectus? Have you seen Homo erectus? Have you seen Homo habilis? Have you seen Australopithecus? <laughs> if I'm, I'm talking about facts, I'm talking about, um, I've, I've told you about certain fossils and every time I ask you about them you evade the question and you turn to something else but I have told you about four or five fossils <laughs> and you seem to simply be ignoring what I'm saying and I and Why I don't you go and look at those fossils any observations any observations help me out here sir he wants her to look at the fossils is that a bad thing I think uh, maybe you've heard me say that for the last two days 
Go look at the evidence. Go to the museum. By the way, I've got a couple of quotes that he, I could write my name to him. I'll show them to you in a second. Any other observations? Anything else? Ma'am? Four things repeatedly. Okay. Anything else? Any other observations? I'm sorry? He keeps, yeah, you see the condescension coming through. He does cut her off quite a bit, but again, in full disclosure, it's more dramatic because I have cut, I have made cuts, okay? I, I, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to mis misrepresent. Just, just be clear on that. He does cut her off. How about you, ma'am? I told you, I told you, yep. He's getting exasperated. Why? What? He's frustrated. Why? He, she's asking him for evidence, and he won't provide it. But he is providing it. I told you about Australopithecus. I told you about Homo erectus. I told you about Homo habilis. I told you about Archaic Homo sapien. Think about this for a second. Have you ever gotten conversations where you ask somebody a point-blank question, they don't answer it, and they kind of skirt the surface? What do you do? I'll tell you what I do. Oh, no. <laughs> I asked you this. You're going over here. Let's get back to this. He's doing to her exactly what I would do to anybody else when I'm in a conversation. If I ask you a point blank question and you go somebody else, somewhere else, I know I've got you. He's getting exasperated because she's not dealing with Homo habilis, Australopithecus, Homo erectus, and Archaic Homo sapien. How many in here tonight feel comfortable giving an answer on uh, Australopithecus, various forms of Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Homo habilis? I'm not trying to be disrespectful. But when you don't know, and they throw this at you, then it's all you got is you throw your hands up, and well, they must have something, because I don't have a clue. I don't operate like that. When somebody stumbles me up, trips me up, I'm telling you right now, you're not going to get me twice on the same thing, because I'm going to go and dig. Listen. You said there are no fossil intermediates, and when I told you about fossil intermediates, you changed the subject. Way too many Christians are willing to do that. I don't think we do that. I think we, to the best of our abilities, answer the question. These are the quotes that I told you about. I want you to look at the facts. Don't believe what you've been told that there's no evidence. Just go look at the facts. I want you to go to the museums and look at the facts and don't believe what you've been told that there's no evidence. Just go look at the evidence. I could write my name to those quotes because I say the same thing every time I speak on this topic. That's what I want you to do. I don't want you to trust me. I don't want you to regurgitate what you heard me say. I want you to study for yourself because when you study for yourself, then you can speak with authority. If you're regurgitating what you heard somebody else say, it's never yours. By the way, another tool that's used to get us to doubt, intimidation. I told you. Boom, boom, boom. And it works really well. It really does. So let's take his information, the enormous amount of evidence uh, in the human fossils and various species of Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Archaic Homo sapien. We're going to take them one by one because I want to give you some answers. And I want you to at least feel a little comfortable if you're ever confronted with these things in the future. Remember Lucy, who was here this morning? That's Australopithecus. That's one of the Australopithecus, various forms of Australopithecus. So let's take the guy who discovered Lucy, and, and uh, let's use his chart. This is his chart that shows that you start over here with Artipithecus, and given enough time, it evolves into Homo sapiens. By the way, before I start filling in this chart, remember the talk that I did last night. What can you know from just this chart before we start filling it in? You've got two different types of lines up there. You've got bold lines and you've got skinny lines. What do the bold lines mean? Evidence. What do the skinny lines mean? Remember that. Remember that. The skinny line is the story. The bold line is the evidence. So now let's look at his chart and start filling it in. All right. We move up to uh, here. And there's Australopithecus, 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 Australopithecus. There's various species of Australopithecus. Carl, what are you going to do? Looky there, looky there. By the way, according to this chart... This is the common ancestor between humans and apes. From this chart, 
What can you tell me about the various species of Australopithecus? They all lead to apes, with the exception of Lucy. Lucy is the supposed common ancestor. So when he throws out there, well, we've got various species of Australopithecus. Yes, sir, and every one of them other than Lucy, quote-unquote, according to the chart for the guy who discovered it, are ape. They are not in the human lineage. So why are you, sir, using them to show that we evolved from an ape-like ancestor when these are not in our lineage? They are ape. Go to the David Koch, I told you this this morning, Hall of Human Origins. Look at every one of those. Every one of those, it will tell you it's an ape. It is nothing human. Nothing. So why are you using those, sir? Done. See ya. Ah, but Lucy... We talked about Lucy this morning. So this is going to be very short, very concise. Remember the museum that got the bones out of Africa after years and was able to bring it here to the United States and put them on display? Their study guide, what does their study guide teach? This isn't a creationist study guide for the bones. This is the one that they created for the museum display. And on page 20, it teaches, for many years, Lucy was thought to be a direct human ancestor, but we now see her as belonging to a separate group of hominids from those which became our species, Homo sapien. So according to the study guide, for the people that made it, made the exhibit, she's not in her lineage. Dr. Dawkins, why are you using that? It's not in her lineage. And here's another one. This is from the Jerusalem Post. Lucy is not an ancestor of human beings. Let me give you another quote, all right? This is from a guy that, uh, Richard Leakey. Oh, come on now. Is that a famous name in evolution or what? Is it? Have you heard that name before? If you hear Leakey, it's almost evolution Leakey. I mean, that's just the way that it is. As a matter of fact, we've got to show respect. The name Leakey is so amazingly famous that when I say Leakey, please hum. All right? Can I hear you hum again? Hum. All right, this is not a chant, this is just a hum. Hum. All right, so what did he have to say? If pressed about man's ancestry, I would have to unequivocally say that all we have is a huge question mark. To date, there has been nothing found to truthfully purport as a transitional species to man, including. This is one of the leading names in evolution, and he tells us point blank that. She's not in the lineage. I would have to suggest that there's more evidence to suggest an abrupt arrival of man rather than a gradual process of evolving. So guess what, Dr. Dawkins? So much for any of the Australopithecus. Why are you using Australopithecus? Because according to the charts from the secular people, from the evolutionists, it's not in our human lineage. It's not in our lineage. So why are you using that, evi using that as evidence that we evolved? Oh, but he gave us more. He gave us homo habilis. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I'm going to go look at the evidence. That's all I know how to do. And there's Homo habilis, discovered by Lewis Leakey. That was a test, and you failed. <laughs> I only heard a quarter of you humming. He discovered, his team discovered this in Old Divide Gorge. Uh, by the way, um, let's go back to a quote here. If pressed about man's ancestry, I would have to unequivocally say that all we have is a huge question mark. To date, there's been nothing found to truthfully purport as a transitional species to man, including Lucy, since 1470. Who's 1470? You understand that when they find bones, they give them names as well as numbers. Okay? They give them names as well as numbers. That number is originally, I should say, was originally assigned to Homo habilis. He was telling, telling us at that time that this 1470, which was assigned to Homo habilis, it has nothing to do with the human lineage. Now, they later reassigned 1470 to Homo rudolfensis. We'll talk about that in a second. Why did they reassign it? Oh, that's an interesting story. We don't have time. Go read it. It's amazing how these things can bounce around from one thing to another. But let me take you to that David Koch Hall of Human Origins website. Yes, this is it. And boy, are we in trouble. We read right here, discovered in 1960, and we've got all the great information. Uh, right here it says this. We don't know everything about our ancestors, but we keep learning more. What don't we know about... Uh, Homo habilis. This, these are their questions. I'm just blowing them up so you can see them. Was Homo habilis on the evolutionary lineage that evolved into later species of Homo and even perhaps our species Homo sapien? If you're asking that question, that means you don't know. So Dr. Dawkins, according to the David Koch Hall of Human Origins, 24.5 million of our tax dollars went into building this presentation 
They're asking the question they don't know. So why are you using it as a dogmatic fact that this is an evolutionary ancestor for us? Oh, there's even more questions. Are Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis, remember that one? Indeed, different species, or are they part of, the same, uh, of a single variable species? Or was one the ancestor of the other? You don't know? No, they don't know. If Homo habilis is not the ancestor of Homo erectus, how does it fit in our evolutionary tree? Look, if you don't know that, then don't use it as a dogmatic statement of fact that we evolved from some ape-like ancestor. You can read the rest. It's got a lot of good stuff in there. I won't read it all to you. But guys, the bottom line is, they don't know. And let's go back to the chart that Dr. Uh, Johansson did. Take Homo habilis, extend it out. According to their chart... Would Homo habilis ever lead to Homo sapien? So just using their chart, it's not in our lineage. So much for that one. Oh, but we got you now. Yes, sir. We have upright walking man. What are you going to do now? We have upright walking man. Take a look at this. There it is. Man. We are in trouble. Let's go back to the chart and uh, find Homo erectus on the chart. There's Homo erectus. Extend it out. Would it ever reach the human lineage according to their chart? So why are you using that, sir? Oh, but, 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 but. I'm going to bring this one up because he didn't talk about it, but I've been hearing it more and more. Homo ergaster. Uh, I don't know. What you find is that, uh, you know, Christians and non-Christians are really very similar if there's a leader in the non-Christian world that's saying something, then all the minions use it. Same thing in the Christian world. We repeat what the leader says, okay? That's why I don't want you to regurgitate. I want you to go study for yourself because you can, you can catch the regurgitators. It's easy. Oh, Homo ergaster. Oh, really? Have you studied Homo ergaster? What do you know about it? Because I went and I looked it up. Here's what they say about Homo ergaster. Maybe early, an early form of Homo erectus. Maybe? So you're putting all your eggs in something that may be? Its designation as a separate species is debated. So you're trying to use something that's being debated to give me evidence that I should not trust God, that he did what he said that he did, the way that he said that he did? Oh, it's get, it gets even worse, because take a look. Then I did some, did some more digging, and there it is. Uh, Homo ergaster. Richard Leakey discovered it in 1984. Thank you. Oh, oh, oh. 1984, 1984. Have we been reading another quote by the same guy? Anybody remember the quote? To date, there's been nothing found to truthfully purport. Remember that quote? When did he make that quote? Right there it is, 1990. So six years after discovering Homo ergaster, the guy who discovered it says it's not in our lineage. So guys, why are you using that to tell me that we've all from some ape-like creature? Go look at their charts. Chart after chart after chart. Homo ergaster, boom. Homo erectus, boom. Homo habilis, boom. None of them lead to us. You see the dotted lines? Get rid of the dotted lines. What does the evidence show? One thing stayed, one thing never changed from or into anything else. Oh, but Carl, now we have you. Yes, you're toast. Archaic Homo sapien. Man, Neanderthal man. Have you ever heard of Neanderthal man? Yes. Now you're in trouble. There's Neanderthal man. According to this chart, Neanderthal man, would he ever lead to Homo sapien? Oh, but he must be there. He must be, a, he must be an evolutionary ancestor. We have video. I mean, look at this guy. And I mean, this is a man that needed a dental plan. There is no doubt about it. Look at those eyebrow ridges. There's no doubt that he came from an ape. I mean, you got those big old eyebrow ridges. That proves ape, human, he's on his way up. Well, you know what? If you think that just because you got big old eyebrow ridges, that means that you're coming from, up from the apes, we have another problem. And I'll let you tell that to this man right here. You want to tell him he evolved from the apes? You go for it. He's a seven-foot-tall professional boxer, and he's got eyebrow ridges that'll last for days, man. I'm not telling him he came from the apes. Guys, a hundred years from now, we find his skull. What kind of pictures could we draw from him? Oh, he must have been this and he must have been that. By the way, take a look at this skull right here. This is a, a quote-unquote Java man. Look at that. 
what you see in the human range today, you find all kind of skull sizes and shapes and stuff going on, guys. Doesn't mean that we've all from apes. It means you got some people with a messed up head. Ah, but Carl. Ape the Man, History Channel. Listen to what they say about Neanderthal Man. Neanderthal seems so promising when it's first presented. It seems like it's going to be the answer. But on closer inspection, it starts to fall apart. Most importantly, the key fossils just seem to be too much like humans. Neanderthal, at best, is a man with some ape qualities. At best is a man with some ape qualities? By the way, go to Neander Valley where they discovered the bones. And this is the way they drew Neanderthal man when they first found the bones. Pretty scary guy, I got to tell you. Would not want to run into him on a dark night. By the way, all we have are bones. How can you know how much hair something had on it from bones? Seriously. Oh, that boy, he's bald as a cue ball. Him, man, he was full head of hair. All you have are bones. You know how much hair something something has on it from bones? And look at the toenails. He not only needed a dentist, he needed a pedicure. How do you know how long somebody's toenails are from bones? Well, don't worry. They found more bones later on, and then they drew Neanderthal like this. He lost all the hair off of his body. He's having to wear skins now, and he's walking upright. He's not hunched over anymore. They found even more bones. This is Neanderthal man today. You put him in a business suit, walk him down the street, you couldn't pick him out of a lineup except he's wearing a suit. And I don't like suits. He's wearing a tie. I don't like ties either. I'll tell you why tomorrow on Sunday. You know what I find interesting? I've been in this for a long time. And one of the guys that helped me in ministry, I was talking about him just the other day with some folks here, was a man named, uh, named Dwayne Gish. Dr. Dwayne Gish. He debated anybody and everybody. When he passed away probably five, six years ago now, he had to have had at least 500 debates. He debated anybody. That looks just like Dwayne Gish. I find it very interesting that Neanderthal man has evolved into a missing link. No, it's evolved into a creationist. Guys, and I mean no disrespect to Dwayne Gish. He, I loved him. He was a, he was a dear man to me. Um, well, so much for uh, Archaic Homo sapien. By the way, if you, do you think, do you think that if Miss Wendy, and I mean no disrespect to Miss Wendy, if she hid, okay, uh, Dr. Dawkins, you said Australopithecus, various forms. Well, take a look at this chart here. This chart shows that every one of those Australopithecus are not in our human lineage, and Lucy is no longer accepted as being in the human lineage. Why are you using that as a human ancestor? By the way, Homo erectus, da-da-da. Do you think if she had done that, the conversation would have gone a different way? Do any of you feel a little bit more comfortable talking about Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Homo habilis. Anybody feel a little bit more comfortable? Guys, you can do this. You can study these things. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to just listen to me. You can go get it for yourself. Well, that leaves people. But let me take you to the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Human Evolution. Yes, my $55 book on human evolution. I'll sell it to you cheap. This is not Billy Bob's book on human evolution, okay? This is not the cut rate deal. This was $55. I only needed one picture. Anything look interesting to you? Evolution is a fact, you fundamentalist hicks. Then why do you need 11 question marks? Well, let me give you another chart. Oh, yes, you fundamentalist. Um, why do you need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6... Uh, six question marks. And by the way, why do you need all the skinny lines? I mean, there's no evidence. And guys, use their charts. You're having a conversation with somebody that believes you're an idiot for believing in, in God? Uh, excuse me, then here's the alternative. Um, why do you need all these question marks? Why do you need all these skinny lines, which means there's no evidence? Why do you need something like this that says, oh, black and blue? What's blue? Hypothesized evolutionary links. What's that mean? No evidence. 
What's the black stuff? Time span of fossil species. Get rid of the blue. What's the black show? People have always been people. Apes have always been apes. By the way, various species of Australopithecus. Look at where all the Australopithecus are. Ape. Go to the Smithsonian. Oh, Carl, you fundamentalists. Looky here. Give me three and a half hours of your life. I'll go through every one of those with you. But you know what? I don't like that explanation. So you know what I'm going to do? I put my finger on the cool little circle right there, and I slide it down, and all of a sudden, I can totally rearrange the evidence into another explanation. Some of them morph together. Some of them disappear completely. Some of them... And I've got another explanation on how all of this works. Oh, I don't like that one, so I'll put my finger on the cool little button again, and I'll slide it down, and I have another totally different explanation. Guys, that's a pretty sweet deal. If you can take these things and arrange them whichever way you like, well, that one doesn't work, so I do, oh, now I like that one. Oh, I don't like that one. I slide it down and get it. Could a Christian get away with that? Have you ever seen this cartoon? They, they love to use this to make fun of Christians. Big mathematic formula, big mathematic formula, then a miracle occurs. And you got the smart Joe that's saying, oh, I think you need, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. Love to use that to make fun of Christians. You fundamentalist six, all you have is a miracle. You believe in a miracle. Oh, yes, I do. But may I humbly? Let's look at your chart. Um, let's get rid of your skinny line because that's all uh, story. So we get rid of the story, and may I say that uh, you should be a little bit more explicit here, a little bit more explicit here, a little bit more explicit here, a little bit. Are you getting my point? Every time one of these things turns into another thing, I think you should be a little bit more explicit there if you want me to sell out the Lord Jesus Christ for your chart. They have faith. I have faith. I admit my faith. My faith is in a God that created the way that he said that he did. And if he did, I should see evidence for it. Boy, I see it. But we both have faith. It is not a blind faith. Oh, Carl, there's got to be more than that. He has to have more than that. He does. Look at the evolution of the horse. Look at the evolution of the elephant. There are evolution of the whale. There are so many beautiful stories. I mean, you'd be fascinated. You, you would think that these fossil histories are to the greater glory of God. If so you go and would it... Would... Hmm. The evolution of the horse. Okay, this is in almost every biology text that I see. It's in every museum that I go to on natural history. Uh, and here we go. Looky here, looky here. It has, starts with four toes. It gets three toes. Then it gets to one toe. There's only one problem. Go read the reports on it. The most famous of all horse trends, gradual reduction of the side toes is flatly fictitious. It's not true. Oh, but Carl, I went and bought the $70 book on horse evolution. I'll give you a package deal with the human evolution book. I just needed one picture. Do you see all the dashed lines inside of there? Why do you need all the dashed lines? Because the evidence doesn't work. By the way, don't trust me. Listen, the record of evolution is still surprisingly jerky, and ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. Um, forgive me, forgive me. How many examples of transition did we have in Darwin's time? Goose eggs, baby. Now, I may not be a genius here, but could you help me, please? How can you have fewer examples than zero? I mean, are we like in negative numbers here? I have negative three, I have negative five. Ooh, negative three beats negative five. You got less than zero? Why less than zero? By this, I mean that some of the classic cases of Darwinian change in fossil records, such as evolution of the horse in North America, have had to be discarded or modified as a result of more detailed information. The horse evolution doesn't work. By the way... This is a hard part. I must come clean. I've been studying this for a very long time, and I have actually found that there is evidence of evolution of the donut. I have studied donuts for years now, and I now know beyond a shadow of a doubt that donuts evolved. I'm going to prove it to you. You see, there are only two ways that we got a donut. Number one, man made it. But my research shows that is not true. My research shows that approximately 65 million years ago, we got a lump of dough. Now, where did the lump of dough come from? I don't have a clue, but we got a lump of dough. And some of those lumps of dough, they had mutations, and they became flat and hard, and they turned into the cookies. And some became puffy and turned into bread. I'm not a cookie and bread guy. I'm a donut guy. 
And then some of those lumps of dough, they had mutations and they turned into the plain donut. Plain donuts are boring, okay? I studied them, but very briefly, I moved on to a very specific field of study. And some of those plain donuts, they had mutations and they got lumpy and bumpy and little sprinkles and foo-foo things. But the, those are girly donuts. I mean, that foo-foo sprinkle stuff, I don't, I don't do that. Um, and then some of those plain donuts, they turned into the bagel, the bear claw. Now, I do have a minor in bear clawology. I have done some serious research on bear claws. And the Cheerio. And by the way, by the way, you laugh. I can prove this to you scientifically because you see the bear claw, the bagel, the Cheerio, the bread, the cookie, and the lump of dough are all 98% similar. So they obviously all came from the same source. You've heard that about the human and chimp DNA, right? Oh, we're 98% similar. So of course we've all from the same place. First of all, we are not 98% similar with a chimp. I'll, sh I'll show you a secular video if you want to see it that explains how they get the 98.77% similarity by disregarding 22% of the human DNA and 8 or 14% of the chimp DNA. Then what's left, you insert spaces to make them line up and voila, we're 98.77% similar with a chimp. Dude, that's throwing out a lot of information there, okay? But, 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 for the sake of argument, let me tell you that we are. We are not, but I'm saying for the sake of argument, we are 98% similar with a chimp. Have you ever been driving and it started to rain? Anybody? Anybody? Was the first thought that came through your mind when it started to rain is, I have better pull over an underpass or my window might get busted out by a watermelon? None of you thought of that. You should be afraid. You should be very afraid. Because you see, a raindrop and a watermelon are 98% similar. So one of these days, you've heard of raining cats and dogs. Oh, no. Guys, the 98% that's similar, that's not the issue. It's the 2% that's dissimilar, that's so dissimilar, there's no way they came from the same source. But... Let me finish my illustration. You see, my field of study is the jelly-filled donuts. Yes, I have a PhD in custard cream donuts specifically. Is there anybody in here who will accept my explanation of donut evolution? Anybody? Do I have any new converts? Thank you very much. I am starting a new cult. The dues are 100 bucks a month. I'll send you the free t-shirt, but you got to buy your own donuts. Most of you are laughing at me. That's ridiculous. By the way, doesn't that chart look familiar to you? You've seen it before. Where did you see it before? Remember when I talked about the evolution of the whale? That is the evolution of the whale chart. And all I did was take out the skulls and replace them with donuts and bear claws and bagels and Cheerios. Watch. It's the exact same chart. The dashed lines are in exactly the same place. The question marks are in exactly the same place. You laugh at my explanation of donut evolution, but this is science. Dr. Dawkins, you want to use this to prove to me that a some sort of a wolf-like animal went back into the ocean to become a whale? Seriously? Guys, if we start teaching a generation to use their charts and say, excuse me, do you see this? Do you see this? Maybe we won't have 50 to 88% of our kids raised in the church walking away when they're 18 if we teach them how to critically evaluate and apply their faith. Memorization without application is not going to work. I mean no disrespect. But we have put so much emphasis on memorization without application. It's not working. You need application as well in this culture today. And by the way, do you notice the question marks? Do you know what a question mark means? They have faith. You Christians, you have faith. Excuse me, sir. Every time you got questions, different colored lines, skinny lines, dash lines, you have faith. We both have faith. The question is which one? Am I willing to put my faith in? I can't answer that for everybody. I know where I'm going on that issue. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do it. 
I have one, I have found one other piece of evidence for evolution. I found it at Kentucky Fried Chicken. I did. And this is legit. This is real. It's a missing link. You know, I, I, I haven't figured out how it fits in the whole family tree here. I mean, it could be the common ancestor between the fork and the spoon. That's one possibility. Or, or maybe, maybe you start with the spoon that evolves into the spork that evolves into the fork. That's another one. Or you could reverse it and maybe you got the fork and then you got the spork and then you got the spoon. But I know it's, it's ac absolutely evidence for evolution. It has to be because uh, I, I dug down deep in my silverware drawer and I found babies and uh, I know that these things are evolving. And even scarier, I found different races of the thing, so I know it has to be true. Now, I'm not doing the talk here on the fact that there's only one race to human race. I'm just messing with you right now. But guys, seriously? I love Dr. Dawkins' quote. Faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Well, sir... When I see question marks, dashed lines, different colored lines, you, my friend, have faith. We all do. We all do. Come on, Carl. Can't we just all get along? I mean, why do we have to fight and argue? I'm not into fighting and arguing. I'm not. But I am commanded, and you are commanded to give an answer for the reason for the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear. We're commanded to do that. That's not arguing. That's not fighting. You know, my, I'm not going to say who, but I've got someone who's very close to me. His wife could care less about what I do. She does not care about this stuff at all. Doesn't bother her at all. Carl, I just believe. And I'm like, praise God. I'm glad you have a faith like that. But let me ask you, what about your son? Um, See, I'm not worried about somebody who loves the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, strength, and they could care less about these issues. But you know what I do care about? Is this generation sitting right here that I know is getting chewed up and spit out. It's not about me. It's about passing on to a generation that is under attack. And it's our responsibility to train them to deal with these things. Can't we just get along? I mean, come on. What, would it make you happy? If uh, we were to agree uh, in uh, that there is some evidence regarding macroevolution, um, would that alone make you happy, or would you still be unhappy and feel that your cause is unsuccessful if many of us still believe that there is an intelligent being who caused this to happen? For sake of definition, uh, she used a term that I don't personally like. Microevolution, macroevolution, macroevolution are big changes like uh, um, like uh, the lizard, the, the dinosaur turning into the bird. That would be macroevolution, macroevolution. But microevolution are these tiny changes, tiny changes. And so over time, those tiny changes add up to the big changes. When you say microevolution, macroevolution, to me it gets confusing. So, but what she's asking basically is, would it make you happy if we accept the fact that these tiny changes could make some changes? over time and turn one thing into another thing. Would that make you happy? It would make me enormously happy. I would love it. If you, if you said, yes, 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 evolution is obviously a fact. I accept evolution, but God did it. I mean, that, that wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't agree with that, but it would make me hugely happy. At least you look to the why? evidence. Another tool that Satan uses to get us to doubt, bold face lies. Why would he be enormously happy if we said, yes, 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 we accept evolution and God did it? Which is where I started, by the way, in my Christian faith. I told you when I first got saved, my first Sunday school teacher taught me, God used evolution, he did it, he directed it, that's all I knew. Until somebody challenged me to go look for myself and I started seeing the issues with it. Why would it make him enormously happy? Well, I, go to, I go to London about, or England, I should say, eh, typically every other year. And there's a TV show that's had me on while I've been over there called Revelation TV, and the, and the host is a guy named Harry Condor. Well, I ran, this was just, I'm looking through and I find, hey, that's Harry and he's interviewing Richard Dawkins. I want you to listen to a portion of an interview that Dr. Dawkins did with this Christian television program in, in, in London. 
And was there a particular point that, or something that you read or an experience you had that sort of said, yeah, this is it, God doesn't exist? Oh, well, by far the most important, I suppose, was understanding evolution. Um, I think the evangelical Christians have really sort of got it right in a way in seeing uh, evolution as the enemy, um, whereas the more, what should we say, sophisticated theologians who are quite happy to live with evolution, I think they're deluded. And I think the, I think the evangelicals have got it right uh, in that there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity. That's why he would be very happy if we said, yes, 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 God, you, because then he could call us deluded. It's very sad to me that the lost understand our faith better than many Christians. He understands the minute that we say, God, I know what you wrote, but let me tell you what you meant. We have lost it. God's word is true from the New Testament on, right? That's what it says. Thy word is true from the New Testament on. I think I read that in Hezekiah or something like that. Right? Is that what it says? Thy word is true from the book of Isaiah on. No, thy word is true from the beginning. And if God didn't do what he said that he did, the way that he said that he did, he lied. And if I can't trust him in Genesis 1, I'll never trust him in John 3.16. He understands that. He loves it when we compromise. Do I think by giving answers to Dr. Dawkins it would change him? Do I believe that? No. We don't convict or convert anybody. That is the Holy Spirit's job. But our job is to do what he said to do, which was give an answer. End with the story. I was speaking. I finished. A lady came up with her brother. She introduced him to me. She was a Christian. He was not. He's a professor in England at one of the major universities over there. He was visiting here in the States. She brought him to listen to me. Uh, he comes up, she leaves, and he starts peppering me with questions. He teaches global warming at a, at a university in England. And he was chewing me up, and we're going back and forth. And it was good. It was friendly. It wasn't mean. I, I, I'm not going to get angry. And, I'm just not going to do that. Back and forth. Good back and forth. Going and going. 20 minutes into this conversation, this man looks at me, and he goes, you're not what I expected. I said, okay, you can take that a few ways. How do you mean it? Well, I just expected you to get angry because I don't think the same way that you do. I said, sir, I'm, I, I'm not going to get angry at you because you don't believe the same way that I do. As a matter of fact, I spent a long time believing the way that you do. I was 28 years old before I was ever confronted and to trust in the Bible is real history. I said, and, and think about it, getting angry, why would I get angry at you? It's like this, if, if somebody came up to me and they were very serious, they were not just trying to pull chains or something here and push buttons, but they said to me, I believe the moon is made out of green cheese. Am I going to get mad at them? <laughs> I'm going to pat them on the back and say, Brother, you might want to get some help. <laughs> I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to get angry. I'm going to feel sorry for him. And Dr. Dawkins thinks we're idiots. He gets visibly angry when somebody talks about the Bible, talks about God. He gets angry. So you know what that means to me? It's a spiritual problem. Because if he's getting that angry, something's going on on the inside, so there's still hope for Dr. Dawkins. So I'm praying for him. We talked for another 10 minutes and we left. I got an email from that guy six months later. And he said, Carl, I met him on a Thursday. I just want you to know that I received the Lord this Sunday after meeting you. Now, the Holy Spirit gets all the credit. You know that. The sister had been doing the work. She was the Christian. She had been pouring into this guy. She brought him along. I got to throw a little bit of water and some seed. That's all I did. Just trying to be obedient. But what he said next is what really intrigued me. He said, you didn't know this when we were having our conversation, but I had written on my Facebook page at that time, Richard Dawkins is God. To see a man go from Richard Dawkins is God to Jesus is Lord, that's the Holy Spirit. You might have someone in your family, you might have an acquaintance that they are just mean and nasty as a snake. It's okay. They're breathing. There's hope. We don't argue. We don't fight. We give an answer with meekness and fear. We pray for them. We love them. And it's amazing what God does to humble, obedient people. Be that. He gets all the glory anyway, so <laughs> just turn it over to him.